you're looking at the first inexpensive, autonomous, do-it-yourself drone lander and battery swap. See, last summer I built an autonomous drone sprayer that would only spray the weeds in my field. There's a link to that video in the description. But, a drone battery only lasts 10 to 15 minutes before it needs a charge. So, I need an automated lander, battery swap, and relaunch. Now, let's be clear. Other solutions are out there for this problem of drone battery swapping. See the description for links to those. But they all suffer from one of three killer issues for the average Joe. One, they require precision landing. I've got wind, I can't control it within less than a meter or so. Two, they're prohibitively expensive. Think a giant robot arm with vision. Or three, they don't give any plans for how to build them. This is my solution. Let's get into it and see one, how it works, and two, how it was built. This is the brain of the landing pad. It's just a Windows laptop that connects to the drone via a radio in the USB port, and it controls all the motors on the landing pad via an Arduino. This is entirely hands-off. You just hit Start on a window that's presented by AutoIt, and the AutoIt script runs in a loop. First it sends the drone out on a mission, then it collects the drone once it lands on the pad, swaps the battery, and sends it out on the next mission, over and over. Now here's what that actually looks like on the laptop. AutoIt opens up Mission Planner. AutoIt moves the mouse around to click Connect on the drone, turns on base station corrections. Now this is important, it's done to increase GPS accuracy from a few meters to a few centimeters. That really helps us hit the center of our landing pad. <clears throat> then it goes to the flight plan, loads that up, and sends the drone up in the air. The drone completes its mission, and this is important, the last two stops of every mission send the drone towards the battery swap station. That way it lands in a known orientation facing the battery swap station. Just you just have to push it into place on the pad then. There's no need to rotate the drone after it lands. Next, AutoIt calls on Arduino to control the landing pad. The motors under the pad start spinning, which moves a trap nut that's connected to the bars on the pad. Those bars push the drone across the landing pad and into the swap station. Contacts at the end of each bar path tell the bars exactly when to stop moving. That way we get a nice snug fit around the drone. It's very much pinched in place at this point. Now that same Arduino program next uses some linear actuators in the battery swap area to actually make the battery swap. First it puts out an arm to retrieve the spent battery, and then it pushes the spent battery into the catcher tray. Next a battery bay lifts up into place, and that same battery pusher arm pushes the new, freshly charged battery into the drone. The spent battery is pulled back into the now empty battery bay to begin charging. A quick aside on these batteries, they've been modified so their contacts are exposed on the outside of the battery case. The top two big leads are the ones that power the drone, so when this battery is pushed into the drone battery bay, there's similar uh, pads inside the battery bay so that once it enters, it automatically powers up the drone. Similarly, on the bottom of the battery, there's a bunch of smaller leads that are used for battery charging. Those same small leads exist in the battery bay so that when the battery enters the battery bay, it automatically starts charging. So the drone is refueled and ready to fly. The landing pad bars retract, and a separate linear actuator pushes the drone back onto the pad so that it's clear of all of our battery swap equipment. Auto it takes back over here and once again calls on Mission Planner. It follows the same steps as it did before, but this time it loads the next mission in the list. The drone takes off again, follows its new mission, and it lands on the pad again where the cycle repeats. Now, a few notes. Adding more battery bays and batteries is a great idea. Uh, that way we never have to wait for a battery to finish charging before we go on our next mission. There's always going to be one that's charged long enough. Number two, uh, as you look at other solutions to this how to swap drone batteries, they often require very precise landings within a couple centimeters. And my experience says that a gust of wind when this lands can push you off target by up to a meter, no matter how good your GPS or uh, other landing solution is. That's why this landing pad is eight feet by eight feet with these big bars to push the, the drone across the pad. I have yet to miss a target that big, even when there's a big gust of wind. Now, last, in other solutions to this uh, battery swap problem, you'll also see a lot of expensive things. Um, think robot arms with machine vision controlling them to find the battery and remove it. That's really neat, but it's very costly, and it's out of reach for average users. Think hobby enthusiasts or farmers like me. So everything in this build is off the shelf and reasonably priced. So how much does this cost, and how is it built? Let's move on to part two. The bill of materials, that is, all the parts that you need to build this thing, is in the description below. We're going to build it in five parts, 
The first part is the landing pad. The landing pad is essentially two four foot by eight foot, half inch thick sheets of plywood that are built into tables and then pushed together. Uh, that's done so that we have one eight foot by eight foot area to land the drum. A bit of terminology before we begin here. I'll refer to this arm as arm number one because it's the first one to activate as it, as it gathers the drone over here. And this one back here as number two. This groove right here is groove 1A. It's the closest to the battery bay, which will eventually be the battery swap station will be right over here. That over there is 1B. And this groove right here is number two. That's consistent throughout the uh, code that we write for this thing as well. So 1A, 1B, and 2. Now, let's take a look. This is the same view as what we were looking at before, but these tables have been flipped up. So the battery bay would be right up here. Groove number 2 pushes the drone right here. And groove number 1A, that's the furthest from the battery bay, is right here. Groove number 1B is right there. <clears throat> so you can see that there are threaded rods under here and we'll be installing that one just shortly. Uh, and that is actually what drives those uh, arms across the table and then up towards the battery bay. So how do we get started? First, we have to make a table out of this. Each one of these legs is 20 inches long. Use two by two or two by four to attach those. <clears throat> then you're gonna wanna put supports on. I would suggest either two by two or two by four all the way around these three sides, but in the middle here, right here and here, Use two by six. We'll get into that in just a moment, but it needs to be a little bit thicker because you'll be taking a notch out right here and right here to allow these threaded rods to pass through. So that's a two by six. Then on those legs, you want to add these cross braces. You see right here we have 45s cut in. Up here we have 45, 45. That just keeps those legs from wiggling when we're moving this thing in and out. One last note before we move on. You can see that this is just slightly smaller than this. I actually took four inches off the top and the side of this table over here. That's because I can set it inside this one right here, like a, a matryoshka doll, like a nesting doll, so that when I'm transporting this in a vehicle, I can actually nest these things and they'll all fit a whole lot easier. Now that you've built these into tables and added the legs and support, you're gonna push the two of these things together and you're gonna start cutting these grooves, 1A, 1B, and 2. You'll actually start with groove number two. And that goes all the way from five inches in from the back side of that, all the way up to about five inches from the front of this. Now, I screwed this piece of two by two fairing strip on first, and then I figured out just how wide my drone was. Go ahead and check the section on building the drone if you don't already have a drone. But if you've got one, you know how wide the landing pad for your drone is, so you can figure out what the center point of that drone is here. For me, this was six and a half inches off the edge. Now what you do, is you take a circular saw like this, snap a chalk line back there, and you run your circular saw along that from five inches in to five inches to, to the edge, right along that line that you want it to travel. And you have to make that about a quarter of an inch wide because you're gonna have a piece of metal poking up through there and you don't want it getting caught. So that's the first one that you're going to run. Now, the 1A and 1B come next. They are 18 inches in from the edge here, 18 inches in from the edge there, and again, five inches from the edge of your table, and you have to check this. It's going to be approximately five inches from the groove that you cut, groove number two. <clears throat> so you want to do the same thing. Snap a chalk line so that you can keep a straight line. Snap a chalk line so you can keep a straight line there, and then run your circular saw along there so that you get a, a quarter inch gap all the way along there. Now that is going to cause you to saw through those two by sixes that you put in the middle of this table right here. Have a look. So those two by six supports will now have a little bit of a saw line through them. That's why you wanted this to be two by six so that it's really thick. Even when you saw through there, you won't saw through the two by six. Now you can cut a little groove right around here. Just detach this two by six from here. Cut your groove right here all the way along all places that that just got cut through. When you use the circular saw, to cut groove number two, you're probably going to notice that this part in the middle of the uh, table gets a little bit loosey-goosey and may sag a bit. You can add in this cross brace all the way across here to support that. All I did was uh, add a little bit of wood right here, a little bit of wood right here, and then 
one long piece of wood, two by two, all the way along there. That's just done so that this has a little extra support right here and can stay at the same height, even though we've cut a long gash all the way through that table. Now we're going to talk about preparing and mounting these three motors. This drives uh, rod 1A, 1B, and 2. So all three are prepared the same way. The first step is you're going to drill a tiny hole through the drive shaft of this motor. More on that in just a second. <clears throat> you should use progressively larger drill bits, so don't burn out a single bit. Run a small bit for a little bit, then a slightly larger bit, etc., until you make it all the way through. That'll keep you from burning up your bits. Second, you're going to want to take your one half inch nut that should fit directly over. <clears throat> this is a coarse thread nut, and it fits right onto this half inch coarse thread rod that we're using for this project. You're going to want to do the same thing drill a hole all the way through one of these nuts. Then, taking your coarse thread, Spin three or four of those nuts onto this coarse thread right here and get them tight so that they're touching each other all the way along. And then take your welder and weld right along that. That'll join all these things so that they're stuck together. This is also that we can build a linkage between our motor and this half inch threaded rod. So now <clears throat> you've got a hole through here, you've got a hole through here. You can take your small screw and drive it right through there. So what you end up with is a linchpin. If this motor binds up or this rod gets stuck for some reason, rather than ruining your entire launch pad or ruining your motor, this screw right here is just going to get snapped right off. The motor can continue to spin and the rod will stop spinning. That keeps you from ruining things if something goes really wrong. Next. You're going to want to take any extra sheet of half inch plywood that you have, just any old piece at all. Drill a one and a quarter inch hole through there, near the top, and then measure so that you can get these screws right here, these bolts right here, uh, hooked up directly with that right there. Now, you'll be able to fit your motor right up to this mounting wood and screw your bolts in just like so. So, this is a properly uh, mounted motor onto just any old piece of wood that you have. Next up, you're going to want to work on your trapped nut on this threaded rod right here. So spin another half inch nut pretty far onto one of these uh, threaded rods. And then, grab any old hunk of metal that you have. Just make sure that it has a hole near the top and it's three to four inches long. Now, you're going to weld this nut to this piece of metal here and here. And the reason that you spin it on is so you don't accidentally get little bits of metal stuck inside your nut, then the thing won't go on anymore. So this is going to be your trapped nut. It will forever stay on this rod right here. So you want this rod right here to turn whenever this motor right here turns. The simple way to do that is to put one of these half inch nuts on put a locking washer on, then spin this threaded rod right into your nuts right there. Once it reaches the bottom, going in that way, we're going to tighten this up, and that will provide a really tight connection. You'll actually use a wrench to tighten this up. It'll provide a really tight connection. I actually have a second one on here so I can get double tightness. <clears throat> um, between this motor and this threaded rod. So when this thing spins, this also spins, and that will move your trap nut on the end there along the groove that you have. Now it's time to mount this mounting board to a couple pieces of 2x2 two two so that you can get them in the right location. Now this is gash 1A. I'm oh, sorry, 1B. So this is the far side. Up there is the near side to the battery bay. All you're going to want to do is drive a screw through your mounting board and through some 2x2 two two like this. Next, you want to get your location just right. This should be offset a little bit from this gash right here. The reason is, when you bring your threaded rod in and screw it in right here, you have to remember that the threaded rod doesn't travel directly under that. That's because your trapped nut over here is slightly offset. Now, you'll probably want to drive a screw that direction to get this thing set just right under the table and then drive a new screw back down this way, uh, removing the first screw. 
once you get that set up, you're going to want to come over here and drill about a three quarter inch hole over here. That way your threaded rod can just poke through, stick out the other side. I went ahead and cut this off so you don't have a whole bunch of extra threaded rods sticking out. You can put your trapped nut and piece of metal through the gap and then screw it in over here. You would put this, uh, this uh, lock washer on the other side and then tighten this all up so that your motor can drive your threaded rod and do the same thing with mounting up above. Now one more thing to remember, you've got this gash number two going right all the way down here and there's no motor mounted yet. The reason for that is the battery swap will actually be located right up there and the motor that drives this threaded rod will be located under the battery swap station. So when we get to that build, we'll talk about where that goes. Get your drone out for this part because you're going to need to use it so that you can get exact measurements for these pusher bars and the contacts that tell them when to stop. <clears throat> the first thing you're going to cut is this 2x2 two two to approximately the length that you think you'll need for this pusher bar. Then you cut these smaller 2x2s two right here and down here and a number 2 pusher arm like this. This should be approximately the locations that it can, or the width, so that it can push your drone easily. So you get these things all cut. Take a notch out of your 2x2s here, here, and over here. Then drill a hole through the bottom side of that so that you can easily fit a bolt and nut. Now the reason for that is the trapped nut that you stuck on that threaded rod is going to connect right there. You see we have a hole in our trapped nut metal and we have a hole the same spot in our pusher bar. And then same thing over here, this will connect to the threaded rod and trapped nut going in groove number two. Now to get the exact dimensions of this long bar right here, you're going to have contacts. So set your drone in place as if it were all pushed up against this rail right here. Push this rail up against it so that it's approximately uh, tight. Not super tight, but a bit. And then run that drone all the way down so that you get the same sort of width right here. You should have a little tiny bit of play, maybe an uh, eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch there. Now, what you're going to do here is create a contact so that as this bar pushes forward, It'll set that contact off exactly when you have that quarter inch of space around your drone landing gear. Now this contact, it's in the bill of materials, it's pretty simple. All you do is you take a bit of solder and you connect a wire here and here. These are the two leads and then this is the uh, uh, flapper over here that sets it off. And you have to cover this in some liquid electrical tape. If you want more information about liquid electrical tape, check the uh, battery build section, we, we cover it there. And then nail this into place. This contact should be tripped by the bar coming into contact with it as it moves in this direction pushing the drone in. That gives you how far this the dimension of this over here. Now you come to the other side and you do the exact same thing over here and right there that bar is going to come into contact with the same contact that you have over here. Now these wires, just drill a hole through your table, run the wire down, and then all the way across over to there. More on that in just a moment. That's going to tell you how, exactly how wide to make this bar. Now, not shown here, I go ahead and screw some extra bars along here. It attaches these two tables together. Not actually necessary since uh, they're probably not going to move, but I like doing it just to make it a bit more secure. Now, onto the uh, wires. All of my motors, etc., and contacts have the same kind of wire and they're traveling under the table over to this right here. I chose to use electrician's staples. One, two, three, four. These are the two motors. These are the two contacts. That way uh, I have just an easy way uh, when I build the battery swap station table will sit right here. It'll have the exact same electrical staples and it'll be easy to just wire nut those things together and get this thing working. Next up, we're gonna build the battery swap station. Ignore all of this stuff over here, that's electronics. For now, we're gonna focus on the wood 
and the motors. What is this? Well, it's a 30 inch by 50 inch table. It's the exact same height as the landing pad. So 20 inch legs, cross bracing with a, a couple two by two or two by four strips under here so that you can support the table. Once you've got your table built, you can start adding all of this stuff on top. The first thing that you're gonna add is the drone landing and pinch area. So you take your drone, you press it in here, and you figure out where to put this strip and this strip. Right now this drone can't move and that's exactly what you want. When you've got it there, you also put one little piece of half inch plywood up here and a half inch piece of plywood up here. That makes sure that this leg can't lift up. So this drone is pinched in place now. Next, you're gonna build your battery bay. This is a battery bay right here and it connects right here with the screws that you see there. A battery bay is just the width of the battery plus about a 32nd of an inch. And then the length of the battery bay is just a little over twice as long as the battery. In my case, that comes out to about 16 inches. Uh, you can make it anything you like. Put this side wall on here. This is just half inch plywood and it's taller than the battery. And then this little piece of balsa wood over here. The reason that that's so short, it only sticks up about a, an eighth or a, a, a quarter of an inch above the actual battery sliding area is because this arm right here uh, is going to reach and actually pull the battery in and it's going to be really, really low. So you can't have this be very tall. Now that you got your battery bay cut, this is the trickiest part of the whole thing. This piece of wood right here and this piece of wood right here have to be cut. So what are these? This is eight inches tall, seven inches deep, eight inches tall and 35 inches deep. So you can go ahead and start those cuts. But this one has this lovely long arm off of here to connect the battery bay. How do you decide where to put that arm? Well, slide your drone back in like so. Set your battery bay so that it's just barely above the drone landing gear. That's actually what's gonna decide this for you. In the front and the back, you want this just above the drone landing gear. Now, you can go ahead and draw on here so that you get an exact height um, and go ahead and cut this piece an eight by seven with this arm coming off so that when you screw on your battery bay, it will be exactly at the right height so that it doesn't connect with your drone landing gear. Next step, when you're cutting this piece, it is 35 by eight, but it has this gash out of it. That's because this linear actuator is at a slight angle reaching in so that it can grab a hold of that drone uh, battery in the battery bay. So you have to, at the same height as that battery bay that you just measured out, you've got to cut a gap out of this all the way down to about 30 or 20 inches right here. So that allows this to be able to enter into there and not brush up against anything. So you've got these two pieces cut now. Well, how do you know where to put them? The next step is to build your battery bay and that will help you figure out where to put those. Your battery bay is pretty simple. It is the width of the battery plus about a 32nd of an inch. Don't worry about the contacts in there for now. That's actually covered in the battery section of this video. So all it is is a little box. Now one important thing, the height of this battery bay right here is such that your battery retrieval tray is going to line up exactly with it. So when this thing is sitting flat on the ground, you can just pull a battery right into that battery bay. That's what decides this dimension right here. Just make sure this is taller than your battery and that's about all you need. So this is the width of the battery, the length of the battery, and it's offset off the ground so that your retrieve tray will be just right. Now this is what you're gonna use to decide where to put this. So to get these two pieces of wood placed at exactly the right position, we're going to use our previous steps. So slide your drone into the locking station here and put a battery halfway into the drone battery bay and halfway into the battery bay that you've just built right here. <clears throat> this is the position that the battery bay will be in when you actually use this linear actuator here to push the battery into the drone battery bay. So you know that this is in the right position. Now you can slap these two pieces uh, right up next to the drone battery bay. I actually slipped a couple pieces of paper on each side to make sure that I had just a little bit of wiggle room. It, it amounted to a 32nd or maybe a 16th of an inch uh, of wiggle room there. 
but this battery you can see right here is actually halfway into both of these so I know that I could easily push all the way through here all you have to do now is uh, mark these with some marker on each side and then come from underneath the the table and screw underneath the table and up. I actually made some drill holes down after I had made the markers so that I had an exact position I didn't have to be guessing about where those would come up. <clears throat> this right here, this long piece, is going to go pretty much straight back. Uh, I actually didn't screw in the end back here right away. I waited until I was mounting these motors to firmly fix this to the table right here. But this part up here, at this point, you can completely fix it. Now, one more thing that you want to add at this point is this strip of wood right here and this strip of wood right here. Same thing on the back, strip here, strip here. These need to be less than a half inch thick. That's because the plywood that's used right here on the battery bay is a half inch, and if you keep this at like three-eighths of an inch or something like that, uh, you'll be able to be sure that you can push your battery in and out of there without contacting these strips. But what's the point of these strips? Well, all they do is they keep the battery bay in position uh, so that it can't go this direction or this direction. And then you can take your retrieval tray and screw it into place as well. Here we are. The retrieval tray has been screwed into place. The battery bay is in place. And I've got a top here, I can screw this in as well. One thing to check at this point is just that this thing moves freely. If you notice that it's stuck somewhere, you may have to shave off a little bit of wood. You can use a utility knife to do that or sand it down if you need to. But you just want this to be able to move freely up and down inside of here. Uh, I actually did, right on the edges here, actually bevel those edges so that um, when the battery's coming in, it's just got an easy path to come in and out of there. And I actually ended up doing the exact same thing on the drone. So if I pull the drone up here, you can see the entry point on the drone battery bay is beveled just a little bit with a utility knife. Now we're going to place these three motors and screw them down. This one right here is the easiest. Just keep it as close as possible to the table and make sure that the end here fits in between your uh, locking station and your battery bay station over here. All it's going to do is push out the drone landing gear so that this thing can take off later. These two here are a bit more difficult. You need to get them at just the right height and the right angles so that they can do their job on the drone here. So the first step is to fully extend them. Use any 12 volt power supply that you have. You see this is fully extended and the end of the battery pusher arm right here is fully extended. Push your drone into the locking station so that it's fully locked. Now you can figure out where to put these. This should be at a height so that it extends all the way through the battery bay. It does not touch the top of the battery bay here. This is sitting on the ground. And it extends completely through the drone's battery bay without touching anything. So this is just suspended in air, not touching a thing. That's how you know that it's going to be able to push the battery all the way through the drone battery, or all the way through the battery bay here and the drone battery bay here. The second is this piece right here. Now it's the trickiest of all of them. It's at a slight angle as you can see here and it uses the gap that we cut out of this to complete its angle. The trickiest part is right here. You can't touch the drone's leg. You can't touch the battery bay with any of this, not with this or this, but you need to be sure that this arm right here is in position so that it can pull back the drone. So you can extend and retract these things at this point to make sure that they don't make contact with anything. And once you're pretty sure you've got that, screw it in place, zip tie it in place, whatever you need to do. I actually added some wood blocks right back here to sort of prop this thing up, support it all. Um, you can see that I added an extra strip of wood here so that I can get the angle right. And then you see here I've got screws that are driving this into place. This is the time also now that you've got it all set just so to fix this with screws coming from underneath the table. Now is the time to add this little arm right here. Partially retract this linear actuator until it's about halfway down this thing. And this is actually just the pieces that originally came inside here. There's a little plastic cap on it. I yanked the plastic cap off. I pulled those pieces of metal from the inside to the outside and then just extended them since it was a really easy way to get an arm that would retract this battery. Uh, this is just some glue. Goop is what it's called. Um, 
you can see in there, it's filled up with goop. So this thing's, you know, fairly solid. The reason that I retracted this part way is now you know that this uh, little lip that you put on right here will be below the arm. If it dries in this position, you know that this isn't going to suddenly start pushing down on your little strip of wood right here. Now for the last linear actuator. This is the lifter that actually lifts up the battery bay. You can see I've taken the top off of the battery bay and I've removed the battery bay out of here. This is a one and a quarter inch uh, hole that I've put in here. And this is where this small linear actuator will push up, which lifts the entire battery bay up. So that when you wanna push the battery in, you lift the battery bay up, you use this pusher arm right back here, it pushes it all the way through and into the drone. When you're done with that, you can set this battery bay back down and accept the battery in for, for charging. You need to fully extend this small linear actuator right down here through the hole that you just cut. Set the battery bay on top of it, like so, and now push your drone into place. You want this battery bay to line up exactly with the height of your drone. Now obviously you don't have all this wood infrastructure down here yet, so you're gonna have to just uh, block it up so that you can get a good measurement on this. But after you have stacked things under your battery, or sorry, under your motor right here, you'll know how far off the ground this motor needs to be such that when it's fully extended, you've got a straight path from this battery bay into the drone battery bay. Now you can take measurements, cut these pieces of wood to, to the exact length that you need, screw them in place, and put this little uh, platform under it. Now you can set this motor in here and give it a test actually run it all the way up and all the way down to ensure that your uh, drone battery bay is just right. Now you can see here, you've also got the pusher arm back here in this fully extended position where it's all the way up. This will be able to push right on through your uh, charging battery bay right here and into the drone battery bay. And you can give it a test once you get this all built. Just an extra quick video so you can get a feel for the tolerances here. Here's that drone battery pusher retracting. I've taken the lid off of the, the, the lid off of this right here so you can actually see all this happening. So here is this retracting into its position and then here is the uh, drone charger bay or the battery charger bay, sorry, coming up. So you can get a feel for what that looks like when it goes up and down. And that's all controlled by the new linear actuator that we just added under the table. This is also the place to mention that if you want to have multiple charging stations, all you need to do is make this a lot taller, this a lot taller, and add more battery bays in here. You'll be able to move multiples up and down, and you'll have multiples of these charging cords coming off the back going to multiple chargers. That way you could charge as many batteries as you like in here, and this pusher right here would be the one to push whichever battery you need to use into place. Now for mounting the last motor that we're gonna use here. We just talked about the linear actuator back here, but what's this? This is one of those mounting plates that we created when we were working on the landing pad. And coming under here, you can see this is the same motor that we had before, and it's got those same half inch nuts coming off of here. We mounted this under here, took a little notch out of here so that the, the threaded rod can come all the way through. What you need to do to get this in place is actually push this landing, uh, sorry, this battery swap station right up next to your landing pad. Get this edge right here to meet up with the plywood on that landing pad. Uh, you can even add a piece of wood over here that connects the two, like screw the wood in over here, screw the wood in over here. And then you'll be able to see where that threaded rod comes through. You're gonna have to take a little notch out of your support right here and uh, you'll mount this so that these nuts right here match up exactly with the threaded rod. The focus of this video isn't actually the drone, it's the lander, but I have to say a few words about the drone so that you have an idea of how to customize your lander so that it fits your particular drone. Now my drone is used for autonomous uh, agricultural spraying. <clears throat> I actually am using the landing pad, it doubles as a tank. These are uh, PVC pipes with right angles and then T connectors here. <clears throat> and this is a tiny pump. The pump sucks water out of there and then sprays it out of these nozzles. I'm using uh, TensorFlow, which is machine learning, to identify weeds versus not weeds and only turn on that sprayer when it's weed. Now the drone is actually just a, a system that carries this thing around. There's no interaction between the, the, the pump and sprayer and the drone itself. So the drone just carries this around and then it does its job. So we're going to remove that so that we don't have to mess with it when we're building this. But that's why this landing gear looks so funny on this. 
So when you're looking at a drone to put in here, I chose an S500 frame. You could go even bigger, uh, especially if you can get longer landing legs. That'll give you a lot more space under the drone so that you can be pushing and pulling batteries in and out. But an S500 frame will work for this. This is just a kit. Build the kit per the specifications. Um, the one nice thing about this kit is it's got a positive and a negative terminal, and that distributes plus and minus all through the board here. <clears throat> You'll have to solder your ESCs to that same plus and minus, connect your ESCs to your motors, and then make sure you get your screws on. Um, when you put your screws on, be sure that you have them in the correct orientation. This is forward on this drone down here, so this will turn in, in, and in, in. You can actually test that in Mission Planner. Once you get this thing all built up and you're not sure which if you've got these things oriented properly, just go to the Motor Test tab of Mission Planner. You can run each of those motors at about 5% and see how they spin. Make sure that everything is set the right way before you try to fly it. The rest of this, <clears throat> we've got a Cube Orange. This is a rather expensive autopilot that works with Ardu Pilot and Mission Planner. Uh, but I really like the more expensive one over the generic ones. It just seems to work better. There's a little power supply tucked way back inside there. It's also connected to the plus and minus, soldered to it, and it supplies this with power. And then plugged into this autopilot, we have a nice GPS here. This is the HERE 3 Plus GPS. It does do base station corrections, which greatly increases the accuracy of your GPS, helps you hit the center of that landing pad. You've also got a 900 megahertz radio here that communicates with your laptop, and then a downward facing LiDAR so that you can stay a set distance off the ground. Now, the important part of this build, the thing that's different than what you may get for a, a drone off the shelf, is the battery bay right here. I customized this battery bay so that I could push and pull batteries in and out of it. So what this is, is um, you take your battery, you cut some balsa wood, and then you secure the balsa wood around the battery. I just used a zip tie to hold everything in place. <clears throat> the one really special custom piece here is We've got uh, copper tape right here and here, and the copper tape extends out to the edge right here. So you can see the copper tape comes out of there, and that's important. That's the copper tape that's going to connect with your battery's copper tape, and then by these wires actually supply the positive and negative voltage for your uh, drone. So <clears throat> to build this thing, you just put some balsa wood snugly around your uh, battery, glue that, and then I put on a second layer of balsa wood below the battery right there, <clears throat> and then some little supports along the side right here. You can see I reinforced the side. Now I actually used Velcro and zip ties to put this on, and I did that on purpose because it's got just a little bit of give. You can kind of see there that it's moving. Um, it's not completely fixed to the drone. When you push the battery in here, you're actually gonna get a lot of torque on this thing and you want it to be able to uh, move just a little bit without crushing the drone's frame or something like that. So you get this thing built and you make it exactly the size of the battery. You have this copper tape sticking out and that's when you have to take your soldering iron and you solder a lot of wires all the way along that copper tape, wrap the wires together, and then bring it up here and solder it onto the positive and negative terminals of this S500 uh, or whatever your drone is, uh, power distribution board. That way, when you actually push the battery into the drone, you'll get a connection from those copper tape into the power distribution board and everything should power up as soon as it gets pushed in there. Now, you should actually insert your, drone, your battery into that battery bay and see if you get a nice tight connection. If you don't have a really tight connection, do what I did. Uh, I have just a tiny bit of felt right here, it's very, very thin, like 1 32nd of an inch. Um, and it just gives just enough upward lift that it pushes those connections on my battery bay up onto those terminals right there. Onto the batteries. LiPo batteries are dangerous and can start fires. These are especially dangerous because we have exposed the contacts of these wires out in the open. So be sure that you never let anything electrically conductive connect any of these pieces of copper tape it will pass a ton of current and possibly start the battery on fire. You should actually store this thing in a LiPo fire safe bag and you shouldn't store it in any place that can burn. So not in your house, not in your shed. Try to keep it outside and away from flammable things in this bag right here. I also put mine in a cloth sack like this so that nothing can accidentally come across those. This is just a mitten. 
uh, but nothing can come across those contacts and accidentally pass a bunch of current and start this thing on fire. What's the right battery to choose? This is a 4S lithium polymer battery. It's 6,000 milliamp hours. What I don't like about it is this is sort of soft plastic and the wires initially came out from the corners of this. Uh, that's bad because it's hard to bend those wires back over and make it connect to these pieces of copper tape here. Probably a better choice is something like this battery right here. You see, it's got a hard plastic shell with solid right angles. It'd be very simple to take these contact wires over here, stick them here, and bring these battery charge wires over here and stick them to copper tape over here. I didn't have two of these. I just happened to have two of these, so it's what I used. But if I had it all to do over again, I would probably choose a solid plastic case like this where the battery's contacts don't come out of the corners. You should choose whatever you have that's a, a large size and probably a 4S or larger because you're going to be powering your drone. The idea here is pretty simple. You want to take the contact wires that come out of here, this is the plus and minus powering the drone, and then your small uh, contact wires that are for charging, and you want to solder them to copper tape and then stick that copper tape to the outside of the battery case in a known pattern. Now, that's easy to say, a little bit harder to do. The first thing you want to do is fully clean the outside of your battery. Take off any stickers, clean off any goop so that it's easy to slide and it's got a flat surface. The next thing you want to do is start by clipping off one of these wires, just one to start, strip it so that the wires are exposed, and then solder it with a soldering iron and some solder to a piece of copper tape that's cut to size. I always start out with the battery contacts first. So in this one, the battery charging contacts that is. So in this one, I have very thin strips. I have to have a total of five of them because this is a 4S battery. So you have ground and then all of the tops of the batteries coming out here. <clears throat> you wanna cut these to size first and take the first one, strip that wire, solder it together and get it situated exactly where you want on your piece of battery, on the outside of your battery case here. Then you want to cover it completely with electrical tape so that nothing else could accidentally contact that while you're working and move on to the second wire. So if we go back to our exposed here, we would have just clipped this black wire and stuck it to the outside. Then we would move on to one of the yellow wires, whichever one is next in the sequence. Uh, you can actually use a multimeter if you want to see which is next. You can, you can see the, the voltages go up from ground. So you'd take your next yellow wire and you'd repeat the process. Be sure that you cover that second contact with a bunch of electrical tape so that you don't accidentally contact it as you're moving on. You'd complete that process for all of these and at the end you would have completely clipped off this charging port right here. Save it because you're going to use it later. Now you want to move on to these. These are much larger wires, so when you uh, cut them and strip them, you would start with, say, the ground here, the black. You're going to cut it, strip it, and then you want to spread apart that wire. It's actually not a solid wire. It's a bunch of very small stranded wires. Spread it out, and you're going to use a much larger piece of uh, electrical uh, uh, copper tape on the back side. So you want to spread it out so that it makes strong contact all the way across. Use solder all the way across to connect all those strands to this thing right here and then you want to stick that contact to the outside. Now one more note, as you're doing this, keep the wires as short as possible. So your black contact that's gonna go right here is gonna be very short. It'll be a very short wire, you'll pull it straight down. The reason that you wanna keep that short is you actually want this piece of wire to be nearly taut. That way there's not a lot of play in the wire so that it's not you know, loosey-goosey around the top here. Um, you do the same with the yellow, etc. And these two especially, you want them to be flat against the face of this battery case so that when you stick them to the electrical tape right here and here, you don't have like a big arc like this, for example. Instead, they're pulled tight against the battery case. The reason that you want to have all of those wires so taut and pushed directly against here is this is the product that you're going to use to insulate the end here. It's called liquid electrical tape. You can get it from your hardware store. Uh, it provides electrical insulation, so all those solder connections are covered up by this, and because it's very sticky and dries pretty hard, it's kind of like rubber cement, all of those wires are stuck hard to this end of the battery. Now it's important, whenever you push this battery, you're going to be pushing it from this end where there are no wires connected. This end over here never gets pushed on real hard. Now these wires are pretty taut and stuck on here well, but you don't want to be messing them around and potentially breaking those soldered connections to all of your contacts. Next up, you want to work on your battery bay connections. It's really easy to make these uh, connections right here. You just cut electrical tape 
in the same configuration that you had for your battery. And you run that electrical tape or that, that copper tape all the way around to the bottom of the battery bay here. Now here, you're going to cut your wires and make a solder connection between your wire and your copper tape right here, 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 etc. And then, remember we saved that uh, charging port, you're going to make the same solder connections right here. And then you're going to cover those connections here and here in that same liquid electrical tape. That'll electrically insulate them, make sure nothing touches them. The other thing that you want to check is that you have some sort of mechanical connection. Now right here I've actually taken just a, an electrical staple, stuck it into the wood, and then wrapped the wire around that so that all this is connected really solidly. So as this thing is going up and down, and this whole thing is uh, connected to a charger back here, none of these wires can come loose. Now, you want to check it at this point. You'll actually push your battery into the bay, and then you'll take your multimeter, Here's your multimeter probes, and you'll connect them here to make sure that you can actually register the voltages of this battery at every step of the contacts on your charging port right here. That lets you know that you've made good electrical connections. If you haven't made good electrical connections, what you're going to want to do is fiddle with the connectors in here. You can actually untape, put another piece of tape under it, which will raise that one up just slightly, and then tape it back down. That should raise just barely that one contact inside here, and it'll make sure that you make contact to all of your battery connections inside here. The last step is to actually test this whole battery bay and battery connection system out. So there's two tests to run. One, you've got your battery charger right here. You're going to plug your charging port into that battery bay, into the battery charger, and then you're going to put your battery into the battery bay. When the charger is actually plugged into the wall, you should see the charging light turn on. This was selected specifically so that there's no buttons to push uh, to get the thing charging. As soon as those contacts are made, the red light comes on and it starts charging, whether you like it or not. The second test that you want to run is with your drone itself. Now in the drone video, we talk about building the drone battery bay right here and putting these electrical connectors in right here. <clears throat> you actually want to slide your drone battery into the drone battery bay to make sure that these two large leads at the top make contact in there and are reliable. So as we push this thing in here, the drone turns on, starts beeping, etc, etc. This section is the electronics and the base station, which is just a Windows laptop. I'm going to flash a circuit diagram up on the screen now. You can pause it. And then we're going to go back and forth between circuit diagram and what you're looking at here. This is the power supply. It's a 12 volt supply and it can supply 20 amps. It's connected to the power supplies of each one of these boards right here. Those are called electronic speed controllers or ESCs. So you get 12 volts at this green right here and then coming out of the top and bottom of this are the motors. So what we're really doing here is taking this 12 volts and applying it to whichever motor is connected. We have a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 channels, and we're only using 7 of them right now. The 8th is actually used by me to uh, fill up the tank of the, the drone sprayer. You're not going to need that if you're just building this you know, without a sprayer attachment. So you're supplying this with 12 volts, and then you're selectively turning it on. This right here is the Arduino. It's a microcontroller and its only function is to tell which of these motors to turn on and for how long. The way that it does that is these little wires right here. So you can see there are numbers along the Arduino right here that tell you the pin number and over here. And each one of these pins, as you can see in the circuit diagram, each one of these pins maps to one of these inputs over here on the motor controllers. So all we're doing is turning on and off various pin numbers over here, which will then turn on and off the signals coming into this side of one of these electronic speed controllers, which has the effect of taking 12 volts and applying it to whichever one of these motors we choose. So it's very important that you get these numbers mapped to the correct places on here and the correct motors over here so that you're turning things on and off in the right order. This Arduino connects through a USB port right here
to our laptop. So the laptop is what actually loads the code onto this, and then this just is off to the races. It does what it's supposed to in its program, and then it stops. When it stops, this thing takes control again and does whatever's next in the list. A couple other notes. We've got a lot of wires here. These are headed off under here, under the table, and over here. When we push our uh, landing pad up next to this, we actually just wire nut this to the uh, correct motors on the, that have the same wires over here on the uh, landing pad. We also have the charger right here that charges, that provides the charging for our battery bay right here. All of these things, the laptop, the power supply, the charger, etc., get plugged into this power strip over here. That's just for convenience. You could use a generator or whatever you need to when you're out in the field. Last note, I use this breadboard for convenience. Uh, this negative strip right here is ground. You have to share the ground of this Arduino with, well, everything. So you get the ground connection right here from the Arduino, and then these right here head over to the ground over here, the ground over here, etc. So you share that ground all the way across. You could just as easily solder uh, wires together and then run it out to all these boards, then you don't need a breadboard. The other place that I do that is right here. This is the um, direction pin for motor 1A and 1B. I just wanted to share all that together to make sure that 1A and 1B always spin in the same direction. And then because I was running out of pins on the Arduino, this right here is a cluster of uh, all connected together direction pins on the rest of the motors. We don't run the rest of the motors uh, sorry, together, so um, we only need one direction pin at a time for those. We, we set the direction once for all of them, and then we only supply power to one of those motors to tell it which direction to spin. On to the Windows laptop. We have here a 900 megahertz radio that connects to the USB and controls our drone. And we have here the just a USB cable that goes between here and the USB port of our Arduino. From there, the laptop can control all of those things. So there's three things on the laptop. Mission planner, which is used to control the drone. Uh, Arduino code, which is used to tell the Arduino what to do. And auto it, which is used to automate everything. So it decides what order to do things in and for how long to do them. Let's dive into the laptop. First things first, install Mission Planner, auto it, and the Arduino IDE from their official sites. Links to those are in the description. I think you've got to use a Windows machine here because Mission Planner only runs on Windows. Now a quick overview of each program. The Arduino IDE is really simple. It's just a zip file that extracts. There's an executable in there, and that opens up an integrated development environment. You don't even really install it. Uh, now, we open a file from there for controlling the landing pad and load it onto the Arduino Uno. Mission Planner is a little bit more complex. You should install it and make some test flights of your drone to build waypoints files that work for you and your GPS coordinates. Uh, luckily, ArduPilot and Mission Planner both have great getting started and first flight pages already out there and a huge community of users that can help you out. Um, so you can get over that hurdle pretty quickly. Third, AutoIt is just an IDE that runs your AutoIt script for the drone lander. Um, the script for AutoIt actually has hard-coded a path to the Arduino startup file. Uh, it's specific to my computer right now, so contact me and I can show you where that is in the script and how to modify it to fit your computer. So, assuming you've got all three programs installed on your laptop, let's look at the actual code to understand what and where Arduino and AutoIt are doing their jobs so you can modify scripts as desired. Let's start out with the Arduino integrated development environment, and this is the main file. We'll start at the top. First thing, we just define pin numbers. These pin numbers and their names should match up exactly with what's in the electronics uh, circuit file that we looked at a bit earlier. The next section, we actually set those pins up. So are they outputs, are they inputs, or are they contacts? And note here at the bottom is actually where we set our contacts. Those are easy buttons. We did have to import the easy button library to make this work in Arduino. Next, we go to the loop where it actually does its job. This isn't really a loop. At the bottom, there's an exit statement. So it just goes through here once and then exits out. And each one of these is just saying, move a motor. You can tell that there's different functions to move two motors or one motor. Uh, and then the, the word limit says if you're going to go to a contact or if you're just going to run for a certain amount of time if the word limit isn't present. We can actually look at those functions down below. Uh, this is where we say, what does it mean to move a motor for a certain amount of time, or move two motors for a certain amount of time, or just a little bit lower. If we want to move until a limit, that means to a contact. When a contact actually is touched, we'll use that function. When the contact is touched, it causes it to drop out of that uh, particular thing. 
So all this is is just run through the thing. It'll run a bunch of motors in the sequence that we want to pull in the drone and then swap the battery in that drone. Next, we're going to look at the uh, auto it is the next thing we're going to have a look at here. So I've minimized all the functions in auto it here because it's a lot of code. Just look at what they are. You've got the main GUI at the top and then it calls all the functions down below. All those are just supporting functions. You don't really need to understand what goes on in there. The only two that are really worth even looking at are the run mission and collect drone swap that you see right here. Run mission means tell mission planner to go run a mission and fly the drone. And then collect the drone means, okay, the drone's landed, collect it back in. So the main code here is actually in this main GUI section, and you see that this is just a loop. And it truly is a loop. It'll continue running over and over, and the line that's highlighted right now uh, is where it runs the mission and collects the drone for a swap. Uh, the way that this gets started is we hit the start button. The way that it stops is actually there's a, a file opened on our desktop that says continue.txt, and if we put a zero in there, it'll tell this thing to stop running the next time it finishes with whatever it's doing. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to run in a sequence, and it will continually go out and grab the next file in whatever folder you told it to look into. That's it. You can modify the AutoIt code as you like, and you can modify the Arduino code if you need to. Uh, otherwise, you have to develop your own waypoints file so that your drone knows where to fly around your property. And that's it. Uh, you can run your laptop from just those few installations and files. Thank you for watching this far. If you're still here, I'm assuming you're interested in building this, and I will help you. Talk to me in the comments, and we'll connect outside YouTube. I can provide guidance, consultation, etc. This really should be a business. Battery swapping is big, and intelligent, autonomous ag drone sprayers are big, especially if you can do a cheap do-it-yourself one. But I'm a retired engineer. I don't really want to start a business, and I only need this to be an autonomous weed sprayer that operates all day without me being there at my farm. But I'm happy to talk to you if you want to run with it. Hit me up in the comments and we'll connect. Let me know what you think in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more unique and useful do-it-yourself builds.